Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eleonora Tafuran Brosetti. I'm a research fellow at the Russia, Caucasus and Central Asia Center. Welcome to a new episode of the Ukraine Conversation. Um, so the war is obviously having uh, an impact, a quite dramatic one, beyond Russia and Ukraine. Uh, consequences are felt in the post-Soviet region, uh, in other uh, regions of the world, such as the Middle East and North Africa or uh, the Western Balkans. And of course, uh, people are very scared about uh, a possible uh, third uh, war, world war uh, that has been uh, sometimes um, described as a, as a possible scenario or a possible outcome of this war. So this episode will uh, focus on the repercussions of, uh, of uh, the, the Ukraine war. And uh, uh, together with me, I have two uh, excellent uh, guests. Uh, let me introduce them to you. Stanislav Sekreiro joined uh, the uh, EUISS uh, in Paris uh, in 2018 is a, a senior analyst covering uh, Russia and the EU Eastern neighborhood. Uh, then we have Dimitar Bechev, uh, affiliated with the Carnegie Europe and a lecturer at the Oxford School of Global and Area Studies, also specializing in international politics of Eastern Europe and Eurasia. Welcome to the both of you. Um, I'd like uh, to start first with you, Stanislav, because you've uh, just got back from um, Moldova, where uh, you've been um, you've been doing uh, field work and you've been interviewing several people. Um, so, in a Twitter thread, uh, you uh, used uh, two words to describe uh, this this experience: uncertainty and fragility. Uh, so, I would like you to elaborate a little bit on your uh, field trip and uh, uh, observation. What's the situation on the ground in Moldova, and uh, how do you think the situation in Transnistria could evolve? Uh, hi, Eleonora. Thanks for the invitation. Great to do this show together with uh, Dimitar. Uh, if we go back to my trip to Kishinev, I would um, uh, highlight several things. First thing one can observe uh, traveling around Kishinev, but also on the roads uh, in Moldova, is to see much more cars with Ukrainian plates. Yeah? And it tells you about the uh, story of Ukrainian refugees in Moldova. Over 400,000 refugees entered or crossed Moldova, and around 90,000 of them decided to stay in. And to use uh, the words uh, which I used in my Twitter, uh, they have a, a lot of uncertainty regarding when they could go home. Yeah? And then 50% of them are minors. Now it's a summer vacation. But if the war drags in, how the schooling for these kids will be organized starting from September, it's again another uncertainty. Uh, second thing which one can observe uh, walking around Kishino is to see the queues at the centers which are issuing passports. Uh, so more people than usually applying now for biometric passports in, uh, in Moldova. A biometric passport is a precondition uh, to travel to to EU. Uh, and again, to refer to the uh, two key words, uh, uncertainty is not only a problem for Ukrainian refugees in Moldova, but also for Moldovans. Uh, 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 some of them, I've heard the cases, uh, relocated their families from Moldova to Romania yeah, for, for a month or two just to see how things uh, will unfold. The third thing, if you go to the shops, uh, you will discover that the prices are much higher than in January 2022. Yeah? Uh, so inflation in, in April reached 27%, and the central bank projects the inflation to hit 31%, which is a pretty big one, and I think among the highest uh, inflation rates in, in, in Europe. And obviously, war is behind the inflation. Uh, uh, it drives higher prices for gas, higher tariffs for electricity, lengthy and more expensive routes of imports. Yeah? Don't, we should not forget that Odessa is the main hub for Moldova imports. It's close and it's cheap. Uh, and as a result of the blockage of uh, Odessa, uh, Moldovan companies have to find different routes, which are much more expensive. And all these reflect in the final prices uh, Moldovan citizens pay for when they go to the shops. And then, uh, again, to refer to the, those two keywords, 
Moldova looks much more economically fragile than it was three or four months ago. And the fourth element, I think, from time to time, uh, what uh, one can see as well, small staged protests by Russian political clients in front of a government building or presidency. So Russian political proxies in Moldova are trying fully to capitalize on the economic problems in order to weaken current pro-reformist government. If one opens TV uh, as well, can uh, and especially the TV stations associated with pro-Russian parties can see uh, a big dose of uh, disinformation regarding what happens in Ukraine or regarding the decisions of the current government. Overall, Moldova goes through uh, and walking around, uh, observing, you can understand that Moldova goes through several overlapping crises. And uh, outcome is an open-ended question. Uh, much will be uh, depend on the actions of the current government, but also to which extent international partners will provide support in the coming month, which will prove very difficult. Thank you. And uh, we've seen uh, the uh, Prime Minister uh, Maya Sandu now in, in Brussels. She's uh, uh, she's met with uh, she's met with um, uh, the President of the uh, European Parliament. So of course the uh, show of support uh, from the EU institutions uh, is actually quite high. Uh, but uh, let's see if this. Uh, uh, you know, uh, support, rhetorical, uh, rhetorical support at least, will turn into um, actual uh, measures and we'll talk about this uh, later on. Uh, I'd like to turn with, uh, to Dimitar now and uh, uh, let's discuss a little bit about the Western Balkans because this is an ar another area outside of the post-Soviet uh, region uh, that has been receiving uh, more and more attention due to the potential uh, spillovers of, of of the, of the conflict. How would you uh, assess the current situation in the Western Balkans and especially in Bosnia and Herzegovina? And uh, um, also, how is the possibility uh, that Ukraine is given a fast track uh, to uh, join the EU? How would this is perceived uh, by uh, Western Balkan states that, of course, have been waiting for years to join the EU bloc? Well, two months into the conflict, uh, I think it's pretty clear that uh, the Rex Kurova is not in the cards, thankfully. Um, there is no appetite at the elite level or at society level uh, within countries traditionally sympathetic to Russia to uh, take risks and use military power to set, set all scores. Um, the usual suspect, of course, is Serbia. To some degree, also the leadership of Republic Srpska, but the behavior that we've seen from President Vucic, who of course got re-elected on the third of April, as well as uh, by uh, Miura Dodik in Banja Luka, uh, I think it's reassuring that they won't be um, overstepping some some red lines. Secondly, the international community uh, and the Europeans have taken some steps. For instance ramping up uh, EU4 deployments in Bosnia as well as uh, strengthening the rule of law mission uh, in Kosovo, um, providing some guardrails, uh, engaging in diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis Serbia. And the main game for those politicians right now, especially for Serbia, is to make sure that they align with some of the demands of the EU without burning bridges to Moscow. Um, in other words, continue to sit on the fence and not joining the sanctions, except for some cosmetic bits of the sanctions. Um, and at the same time, uh, making sure that uh, Russia um, has direct connections, that flights continue to uh, reach bow rates, that there's no severance of links. And if, even if some Russian money uh, finds safe heaven, uh, in bow rates. I think that's, that's, that's the main game played uh, these days. Um, now, this other question, whether the EU will take a border approach to the Balkans, given the geopolitical stakes, and that was the initial expectation uh, after violence 
started in, in Ukraine, that there will be compensatory reaction in the Western Balkans, where, of course, you have a few low-hanging fruits. There's the Macedonia and Albania's negotiations, maybe visa-free travel for Kosovo, uh, speeding up membership talks with Montenegro and X number of other things. I won't hold my breath, and the critical moment, of course, is the summit, the European Council in June, um, but I won't be holding my breath because the signals coming from key capitals are not very encouraging. We had a speech by Macron saying that um, the Eastern Partnership countries be, in other words, Bosnians and Georgians so in the service have to be on the outside. Um, secondly, Olaf Scholz today had a statement, I think, about the ambitions for Ukraine to become a candidate of the country or even to foresee a fast-track membership. So the mood in Western Europe hasn't changed dramatically. Um, still, I mean, I'd like to be an optimist and at least think about a positive scenario where actually there is a compromise between Bulgaria and North Macedonia, and there is real negotiation for membership after how many years? Um, more than 13 years in, in waiting. Uh, but uh, if we are frank about it, that won't be such a game changer. It will look great symbolically, but both Albania and North Macedonia will be the same countries the day after the negotiations. The impact on the ground will take years to to, to show. Uh, so yeah, the good news is no war in the region. The bad news is I'm not sure that the EU will make a, a huge step forward. Thank you very much. Also, it's interesting that this uh, political community that has been proposed by uh, Macron actually resembles uh, what uh, the EU already has with the Eastern Neighbourhood, right? Because the Eastern Partnership was meant to be uh, uh, like a shortcut for the EU to engage these countries without giving them um, the, the membership, the official membership. It was uh, framed as everything mm -hmm. but the institutions, right? So uh, I'm curious whether uh, the uh, public in, in these uh, countries, at least in the Eastern Partnership countries, uh, will uh, react to this. And uh, actually, Stanislav, I want to stick with this uh, EU membership um, topic. Um, so the... Uh, in application by Ukraine uh, prompted uh, the application by uh, Georgia and Moldova. So um, I'd like first to ask you about uh, how uh, the public in these uh, two states uh, talk about this issue. Is there is there a public debate, a media debate on this? And uh, also, how do you assess the likelihood of uh, these uh, three Eastern Partnership countries joining in the medium term? Uh, yeah, uh, I think first what we have to say is that in Moldova other issues are stealing the show. Yeah, It's mainly the risk of war, prices, higher prices, and uh, people as well are worried about the future of their children. So these are the top three things which you can observe in the public uh, surveys. This being said, uh, of course, of course, uh, Moldovan society is overwhelmingly positive about application and EU membership. So again, if you check the opinion polls. Uh, and from this perspective, uh, a positive decision at the Council uh, Summit in uh, June would be a powerful um, signal, encouraging signal for Moldovan society. If you look in Georgia, situation, economic situation is no better than in Moldova, but also it's uh, superposed with a bitter political divisions and democratic backsliding there. Uh, so society is much more focused on domestic problems and pretty much frustrated with the current leadership. Uh, on the one hand, uh, Georgian society is overwhelmingly positive about uh, joining EU but at the same time understands that the actions of a cover, current government take them rather further away from you. Yeah? And just one uh, news, I think this 
uh, this uh, week coming from Belisi about the sentence against the owner of the main opposition TV channel in, in Georgia. If we go at the second level, civil society, I mean, civil society organizations, it's a big issue for them in Moldova. Uh, when I've been there, a lot of discussions, and I would say even more, uh, because of limited administrative capacity in Moldova, they've been involved in helping government to uh, fill the second part of the questionnaire. Yeah? So they've been actively involved in. Uh, what I as well know from the Georgian friends is that civil society there was not involved in this process. And it reflects, a, again, uh, that this huge political uh, polarization in Georgian society. Uh, and if we go at the third level leadership, of course, and for Moldovan and for Georgian leadership, it's a big issue. Yeah? And you just mentioned that uh, Moldovan president uh, was in Brussels meeting uh, uh, high-level uh, EU officials, and uh, right now traveling to Paris to continue the advocacy visit, uh, and probably will meet uh, President Macron, uh, the one who proposed the idea of political uh, community. Uh, I think, uh, and uh, Prime Minister of Georgia was in Brussels as well, trying to do the same thing. Uh, the only problem is that he has less credibility yeah, when he speaks about uh, joining EU, doing reforms. Uh, the credibility is not there. Uh, to which extent these advocacy efforts will be um, successful, I would not try to guess now. I think uh, my, my gut feeling is that Ukraine has the most chances now to get a membership perspective, if there will be a consensus. I would rate Moldovan chances as the second. Uh, uh, and then I think I'm very skeptical about Georgia, uh, to be frank because of domestic political uh, dynamics. Uh, so a, a follow-up question, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so do you think the polarization, societal polarization in Georgia is, is higher compared to Moldova? Uh, it, it, it depends. If we look at the opinion polls on the joining EU, obviously uh, the numbers are higher in Georgia than in Moldova, yeah? uh, on membership perspective. But then if you look at the uh, political dynamics, I think Moldovan government has much more legitimacy than the Georgian government, partially because the crushing uh, defeat of opposition during the previous elections, which were declared democratic in summer 2021. So the, the current government in Kishinev has a very strong uh, mandate from the people to do reforms, to bring it closer to you. The elections in Georgia were pretty contested. Uh, opposition at the beginning didn't want to join the uh, parliament. Then some of them entered the parliament, some of them withdrew. Uh, uh, so there is a cloud of uh, 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 questions about the legitimacy of this parliament and government as well. Yeah? This is a big issue. And if I look so ahead, I think uh, regardless of decision in June, just one sentence, I think uh, these three countries, depending on the will of their governments, will advance in terms of sectorial integration with the European Union. Be it SEPA, be it uh, energy market, uh, many other fields. So sectorial integration probably will be uh, the way to go, regardless of the decision uh, this June. Thank you. Uh I'd like to ask a question to, to both of you uh, regarding the uh, Middle East and North Africa. Um, so you have all um, you have been observing uh, Russia's uh, uh, MENA foreign policy for years. You also uh, edited a book together, Russia Rising. Uh, so I'd like to ask you about the um, spillovers uh, of uh, the conflict in the in the region, and how do you think the, that? Russia's involvement uh, will uh, change, depending, obviously, on the outcome of the war. Dimitar first, and then Stanislav. Well, my understanding is that the majority of the countries in the region, with some notable exceptions, uh, are sitting on the fence. This is not their war. They don't want to get involved either way. And, and they, of course, see the problem with uh, Russian aggression, but don't want to burn bridges to, to, to Moscow. That's, that's, that's the big picture. Secondly, 
uh, what's concerning governments um, in places like Egypt is the ramification for their economy, especially the rising food prices, which if you open the economies, this big issue, that's, that's the cover. And that's something that is beyond uh, the Middle East and North Africa. Um, the inflationary pressure and the sort of um, cost for incumbent government, this is quite high. Secondly, uh, Russia will have much uh, lower bandwidth uh, being bogged down in Ukraine, which is a much more important and critical issue for its foreign policy. Um, leaves little time and resources to do other things and to engage with other. Of course, there will be diplomatic shuttles or what have you, but um, I don't think Russia will be capable of, of doing much in places like Libya, Algeria, um, even in Syria, where, of course, it remains um, on the ground. Stanislav, what's your take? Uh, yeah, uh, I fully subscribe to what Dmitry said. I will add a couple of notes, but looking from a Russian perspective. Yeah? Uh, I think first, Russia definitely will try to preserve hard wound position in the region over hard wound position over the last decade in the region. Uh, but this being said, I think they will have fewer resources uh, and less uh, time uh, to do to cover uh, the region. I think uh, what we have seen interesting first, uh, we have seen tensions in relations with Israel uh, over uh, declarations um, uh, regarding the uh, Ukrainian president uh, and uh, issues of. Uh, 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 history, tragic history. Uh, and then if you look, one of the big achievements of the Putin foreign policy was excellent relationship with Israel. Yeah? But it's not for first time of tensions, and I think uh, maybe this time around they will manage to, to survive and uh, pass this bad uh, phase. Second thing, uh, we have seen much thinner military presence of Russia yeah? and relocation of Wagner and military troops from Syria. So there will be less military means there. Uh, third thing is that uh, Russia used Syria as an advertisement campaign for its uh, weapons. And what happens in Ukraine, it's not a good advertisement campaign for Russian weapons, you know. Uh, so maybe uh, people in the MENA region will be uh, keen to buy other, uh, uh, from other customers, uh, from other producers, uh, their uh, military systems. Another Turkish, important, Turkish drones, for instance. Exactly, exactly. You see some uh, big contracts signed or to co-produce or deliver drones in Central Asia, for instance, yeah, if immediate impact. Then I think another interesting uh, issue to watch uh, Russia-Turkish relations uh, and uh, straits are closed and then Russia cannot use its sea. Crimea uh, Express, which was taking off from Crimea and supplying troops in Syria. And then uh, Turkey, Turkey closed the airspace for military planes, Russian military planes. Yeah, it, it's more costly now to uh, resupply Russian uh, troops. Uh, and then I think what is important to uh, underscore is that Russian diplomacy in the Gulf and uh, uh, the Arab Gulf paid off to expand in order to keep the price oil prices high. Yeah. Uh, obviously, Gulf states were not doing it uh, out of love uh, towards Russia. They have their own pragmatic interests, but in this case, they uh, coincided, and it, it helped Russia uh, a bit. But still, Russian engagement in the MENA and how a, a war in Ukraine will impact it is a story in the making, and we have to carefully observe uh, the ups and downs in the you know uh, Middle Eastern bazaar. Uh, whose uh, prestige and power will be on the rise and whose power and prestige will be uh, uh, on decline in the coming month. We'll be watching the situation carefully. Um, so I've got uh, two questions. Um, one regards the OSCE um, uh, and about uh, its role uh, in, uh, in the current conflict. So is the OSCE in an institutional slash identity crisis? 
And then there is another question about the future of the Transnistrian issue. So maybe, uh, Dimitar, you could uh, talk a little bit about um, the OSCE and uh, also if you have some thoughts about uh, the other uh, international organizations involved in, uh, in, the, in the conflict. And Stanislav, uh, I, I guess you will be answering the Transnistrian question. Thank you. Well, I'm conscious of the time limit, but I, I think that OSC is in trouble. The, the added value was uh, monitoring the implementation of the Minsk agreements, uh, but that is now off the table. Um, secondly, OSC had a role to play in Nagorno-Karabakh, but the war we had in 2020 uh, made it irrelevant and, and the diplomatic arrangement that, that emerged. If Russia suffers a, a defeat, and has to withdraw from uh, Armenia and from uh, sorry for Azerbaijan, the peacekeeping mission. But that's a big if. There might be an international mission. Certainly, the Armenian government would like to see one. In that regards, OSCE might provide the framework as a regional organization to take care of this peacekeeping mission. But that's in the realm of speculation. Um, so that's what I have to say. I mean, OSCE is in trouble and since yes Russia and the West there, I don't see much scope for its engagement. Thank you. Uh, good question on Transnistria and I think the one who knows the answer <laughs> will deserve maybe Nobel Prize, you know, what will be the future of Transnistria. What what is important to understand now is that Russian aggression against Ukraine influences uh, or uh, slowly changes the status quo in Transnistria. Yeah? Uh, in in which uh, in which way in many in many respects. Uh, first of all, Transnistria heavily relied on the trade with Ukraine and especially used the hub uh, for Odessa as well. So now Transnistria completely depends on Moldova proper for all imports. This is first important change. Yeah. So we change to our status quo. Second thing is that um, uh, to go back to the question of OEC, OEC is involved in this uh, five plus two format of negotiations of a Transnistrian conflict. Now, in the current situation, it's very difficult to imagine how this uh, format uh, can be functional with Russia and Ukraine both sitting, you know, uh, as a participants of this format. Uh, uh, maybe OEC will be in the game, but that there is need to rethink and to change the format. Yeah? Uh, and the third element, which challenges the status quo in Transnistria, is that for 30 years it was pretty quiet, and for the last month we had a couple of explosions in Transnistria. Uh, it's a totally new development. Yeah? Uh, good thing no one died. Uh, basically, in one case, building was attacked during the holidays, Another object which was attacked, it was a radio antenna in a village. So uh, the impression is that these attacks were orchestrated not to kill anyone, but to raise tensions and to engineer panic in the region, but also in Moldova proper. Uh, and then the fourth element of the status quo being challenged is there are rumors that Russia would like to replace current political economic elites in Tiraspol with much more loyal people. Yeah. Uh, with a security background and much closer connected to, 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 to Moscow. So uh, to sum up, we see several elements which challenge the current status quo in Transnistria, but we have few ideas uh, how uh, and in which direction uh, the things may go in the coming uh, month. Okay, we're running out of time, but I've got a last minute question from my colleague Giorgio for Dimitar. Uh, the EU is making pressure uh, to Serbia to adopt sanctions against Russia. You, we, we've discussed about this. Uh, but do you think this, uh, that Serbia will uh, align with the EU eventually? And if so, is the EU going to forgive uh, Belgrade's authoritarian drift? I think there'll be some more accommodation, but not to, uh, to the extent that it's all aligned with 100% of the sanctions. What we've seen now is very minimal. Basically, sanctions on Yanukovych and his family, which doesn't mean anything. Uh, and I'll be surprised if Vucic goes the full Monty. And I'll be surprised if there's a, a real 
pushed back by the EU. This, this end result will be continuing the stalemate negotiations leading nowhere and Serbia not making much progress on the enlargement track. Thank you so much. Um, it's been really insightful and I thank both speakers Stanislav Sekreru and uh, Dimitar Bechev for being with us and sharing uh, your uh, thoughts on, on this issue. I thank everyone uh, that followed this uh, Ukraine conversation and uh, look forward to the next episode. Thank you again. Goodbye.